I don't think su surprise is the right word to use because I knew the quality of our team. Um, but quality is one thing, but to be consistent is the second thing. And um, I'm not surprised in this because from the moment I started working with them, I saw how much energy they put in on a daily basis. And that is, I think, the reason why you can be consistent if you bring, if you do the work on a daily basis every day. You can be consistent, and then sometimes a bit of luck comes with that as well. Uh, most of our results were, I think, deserved, but some of them were a close call. To Morris, a, a, a really huge challenge for us to to stop them, to to play with our personality. Uh, we are analyzing and we are building the team, but of course we have to compete if we want to to get uh, the level we, we had last year. Join us today on Telegram for free and enjoy the Premier League. Don't miss out. Link in description below. This game on Saturday evening is a mouth-watering one. It's, we've got top of the table Liverpool against Aston Villa. Liverpool going top of the table last weekend. And I want to start by looking at this tweet from Mo Salah because it's one message about um, Liverpool being back where they belong, top of the table, going for the title. But uh, as we see the tweet now, there is another part to it at the end which <coughs> feels a little bit cryptic. So he says, top of the table is where this club belongs, nothing less. All teams win matches, but there's only one champion in the end. That's what we want. Thank you for your support last night. This is the part I think is uh, dodge. <laughs> no matter what happens, I will never forget what scoring at Anfield feels like. Do you agree that, that, that it's a bit cryptic? The no matter what happens feels like a loaded statement. Yeah. And it's funny coming from a guy who is pretty quiet on social media. We see him occasionally post pictures of him and his family and his uh, or him working out yes. in the yeah. gym on Instagram. Yeah. It's pretty minimal. And at a time where there is so much talk about your future mm. at the club and contracts and everything, to post that feels very pointed and almost unprovoked. It's no one, no one was asked, like, the club's in a good place. No one yeah. needs you to say anything. I don't know, Desh, I know, um, yeah. not to show your age, but the height of social media, <laughs> you know, it was easier when you were playing because social media wasn't as intense as yeah. it is now. But would you have done something like that? Before, you'd be very knee-jerk, very reactive, but players have teams around them now. They've got entourages with them. They've got advisors where very often their tweets are written for them, mm. so they don't even, even write their own posts now. So I think he's had a lot of guidance on that post, what to say, probably how to word it, and no matter what, it's going to create a stir and get people talking, and he'll get what he wants from it, which is tension, the contract, the move, whatever mm. he wants, he'll probably end up getting. But I think he's been advised on that particular tweet. I don't think he just woke up and thought, let me create a cryptic tweet that's going to get everyone talking because he doesn't need to do it. There's some thought gone into that. Well, I think it's all about owning the narrative as well a little bit, which sure. is often why the, you know, there's a lot in these contract talks or transfer, there's always a lot of silence. And then that's when stories might get leaked and the narrative starts being spun for you rather than you being able to own it and communicate on your terms. So it's probably part of it as well as getting ahead of it. Um, but I think whoever the, you know, the, the, the comms are on this and whoever has, you know, drafted it, um, I think the no matter what happens is, is, is the one that feels really pointed. And maybe I would have done it a little bit differently if I was the one behind the keyboard, maybe. I think Mo Salah's put that up himself. I just, <laughs> oh, I, he just went up his, <laughs> he, he just went like, rogue. Yeah, he just saw it. He was like, top of the table, I'm going for it. Yeah. Right? Could be, could be. <laughs> what is brilliant, though, is that Liverpool have three key players on, in the last year of their contracts. You've got Trent Alexander-Arnold, Vir Virgil van Dijk, Mo Salah on the field performance from what I can see, certainly. And they are the slot machine is going great guns. They're top of the table. They're doing well in the Champions League, leading the way as well. That's quite remarkable and maybe a little bit unusual. Yeah, players... They, they would do whatever they need to do to get the best contract possible. Uh. But obviously, they are flying high. They're in a great vo vein of form. Other people be very, very aware of what their contract situation is. So as long as they stay injury-free and continue that form, they're in the driving seat. And then the goal start to heat up and then it will get 
closer to tying down yourself or moving on mm. might be the case. Flo, it's your first time on the show this season, so we haven't really heard from you about the seamless transition from Jurgen Klopp to Arne Slot and just how well he's done um, to get Liverpool top of the table. I've been massively impressed. I think he's a brilliant speaker. I mean, every single time I see him do media, I am so impressed. And we, talk, we talked probably a lot, on, I'm sure you have on this show, but in the media in general about... Manchester United and who was going to be the next coach and succession planning and even for Pep Guardiola and his future those conversations are always out there but Liverpool deserves so much credit mm. for how seeming, seemingly seamless it's been putting this guy in the job and how well he's got going because not many people knew that much about him obviously filling in after Klopp is probably one of the toughest jobs you would have and also a manager who has such a big connection with the fans and I think that's been so impressive with Arne Slot is that he's got his own kind of quirkiness personality mm. and character and he's bringing it to his interviews he's bringing it to what he does with the fans and yeah I'm, I'm so impressed with him and, and you know the results are the results so he's done it all. Yeah, great result in midweek as well against Bayer yeah. Leverkusen when all the talk was about the return of Xabi Alonso. When the team sheet came out at Anfield, I remember yeah. the talk being about Gakpo and Diaz um, and Gakpo probably playing in that false nine role. In the end, it was Diaz who played there and scored a hat-trick. Amazing. I watched the game. So in the first half, it was nil-nil, very, very tight. And in the second half, yeah. Liverpool were devastating. Bayern made, made, made some mistakes. Mm. They got punished for for those mistakes and they just when they're ruthless when they're in these positions here they make good decisions so they often find themselves counter-attacking teams they find the free player they find the spare man and they more often put it in the back of the net I think what's been really um, kind of exciting about Arnold Slot's time as well is that he isn't afraid to try players in different positions. Mm. I think Diaz in an interview after that game where he said, it's, it's not a position I'm familiar with, I've never really played there, but obviously I'm going to do a job there. And what a job he did, he scored a hat-trick, but he's not the only player who's had to play different roles. Yeah. Um, we've seen Curtis jo Jones drop a bit yeah. deeper. We've seen that... Graham you know, Bush is Slot, also... Exactly, yeah. Graham Bush has also had to be yeah. flexible. So... I think it's the trust that the players have in Arne Slot right now to guide them and play mm. them in positions that they may not even realise that they can excel in. Um, because there's depth in those areas. It's not like he, there's an injury crisis where he has to play Diaz there. Doa Nunes has not had a terrible mm. season, so they do have a nine there. But he wants to try something different. He wants to catch his opponent off guard and yeah, it's working in, across all areas. So the million dollar question is, are you starting in there against Villa? Yeah, I'll start him there against Villa. Why not? He just scored a lot of goals from there. He's yeah. getting familiar with the role. And sometimes in football, people can be guilty of overcomplicating things from a coaching side. So if you keep it simple, the players know what they're doing. And more importantly, they feel good and feel confident. They can reproduce good performances. Yeah, Aston Villa now are looking at this Liverpool side that they've got to face on set 1-0 in North London at halftime and then got smashed at Tottenham. They lost in midweek as well. I think that's um, three games they've lost in a row now. Yeah, it's, times are tough over there and I know a lot of Villa fans are a little bit worried about how long and how bad this run could be because mm. they've got a lot of players who are not in good form and old reliable types like John McGinn who have always played at a really high level for the club are looking a little bit lackluster and I think People obviously look to having to take on the Champions League and obviously mm. it's a bigger Champions League too and see how maybe that, how that's impacting them. But I do think they need to expect more and I'm sure Unai Emery expects more from some of those more experienced senior pros in that team who are performing below par. Um, and I think this slump they're in, it's one of those ones where it kind of builds and builds and it feels like you can't see a way out and they, mm. they need to find a way to get out of this bad run. Yeah, yeah it's, it feels like that management of coming from Europe in midweek um, where the Tyrone Mings mistake that led to the penalty, which yeah. was the only goal that was shocking. And, you know, Unai Emery said it's, it's the worst he's ever seen. And, you know, to lose like that on his birthday, um, to see his team <laughs> lose like that. Didn't it was his birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah he was Unai Emery's birthday on that day. <laughs> yeah. um, how does he change it around the manager? How does he get them out of this? I think you, if you start changing too much and you go away from your beliefs and your principles, your philosophy, whatever you want to call it, then you start to question yourself. The players start to question it. I think he needs to stick to his beliefs that help them to become a strong force and then believe they'll play their way through it. They met Tottenham at a bad time. High scores in the league mm. do better when they concede a goal. So they probably need to look at 
possibly the game management a little bit when they take the lead, what they need to do. But I wouldn't steer away too much from what's worked before.